with England. Why do you think we didn't win the collection of players we had in 2004 and six in particular? Because we weren't good enough on the day. Simple as that. It's not about clicks. It's not about Liverpool players not liking United players. We didn't it, know, did we? <laughs> you, you definitely didn't. <laughs> I thought they was all right, personally. Hey, He's dancing know. on a table with a I fake remember. World Cup. I remember waking up that morning, you went, have you seen the picture of my dad? Gaz and Phil. <laughs> Donkey. Donkey. Gaz, it's a horse. It's a horse, is it? Oh, yeah. it's a white horse, sorry. Hey, are they, you? <laughs> 1998, got sent off against Argentina. It was just a moment of madness. All I dreamt of was representing my country. If someone turned around to me now and said, you're back in the squad, you go, wouldn't you? Yeah, I'd go. <laughs> They've got five right backs, they won't be calling me. <laughs> Even if they didn't, I don't think they would. <laughs> On this episode of The Overlap, I travel to Qatar for a World Cup special with an England legend, someone who I've known for 30 years. David Beckham was capped 115 times and played at five major tournaments. We talk about his early World Cup memories, captaining his country and England camps. Right, Bex, welcome to the overlap. We're going to do a World Cup special and we're in Qatar, which is, to be fair, about as windy as Manchester at this moment in time. So tell us about your first World Cup memory. First World Cup memory would have been sat in my mum and dad's house in Chingford in 1982. And obviously my hero at the time, Brian Robson, scoring after 27 seconds. So that's probably my first memory. And every World Cup, me and my dad used to obviously watch all the games. I used to hang a... St George's flag outside of my uh, window in Chingford. So uh, th those were my first memories. In those early years of watching England, what were your thoughts of England in terms of how they played? You know, obviously Brian Robson was your hero, but the style of play, obviously they had difficulties around that time in tournaments. We did have difficulties, but I always felt that our England teams were like full of brave hearts. You know, we had brave players, you know, Terry Butcher and Paul Lintz. But then you had players like Gaza come in and all of a sudden you had this playmaker, you know, Chris Waddle, Glenn Hoddle, you know, all of these great players. So you take it forward eight years to the 1990 World Cup, the Gascoigne moment, the tears, the emotion, mm -hmm. obviously what happened in that tournament? To be honest, you know, I think the whole nation wept with Gaza on that day. You know, I think we all felt that emotion that he was feeling. He was brilliant, wanted to be with Gaza. He was just a brilliant, uh, he was infectious around the place. You know what, he wanted to be loved. It was simple as that with Gaza. You know, obviously I did a couple of different campaigns with him, advertising things, and there was one particular shoot that I was on and my mum and dad were with me. And my mum and dad just, they laughed with him, they cried with him, and they came away from it just in love with Gaza. And, you know, you played with him a lot more than, than I did earlier on. Gaza was one of those people that you just wanted to be around him yeah. because his, his personality was so infectious in so many different ways. That character, you know, that's what makes the game so special. Tell us about that moment where you were first made England captain. Obviously, I was in and around the sort of squad at the time, but you were unbelievably proud, weren't you? It was a massive moment for you. It was a massive moment. I, I just think that as a kid, you, you always dream of representing your country. When you love football as much as we did, I'd watch the games with my dad, I'd watch the games with my granddad, I'd been to Wembley. You know, all I dreamt of was representing my country. So then, to be given the captain's armband. It was just a huge honour to lead England for the amount of times that I did into different competitions. And your responsibilities change. They change hugely. There's no hiding places, place, is there? There was no hiding places. You had to deal with politics on the field, off the field, make decisions. And I was making decisions when really, I didn't know whether I was making the right decisions or wrong decisions. I asked you and hoped <laughs> that you got it right. <laughs> So, so I, I wasn't getting it right. I was, I was going on strike. You, <laughs> you want to stay? <laughs> so, you know, the responsibilities came with being England captain. But to be honest, if someone would have turned around to me when I was sat in the, my dad's living room in 1982 yeah. and said, that'll be you one day wearing that captain's armband in a World Cup, I'd never have believed that. I'd always want it, but I'd never would have believed it. When I look back at my England career, I always thought of it as a roller coaster. Yeah. It was never calm, was it? It was never so... 
<laughs> it was just no. up and down all the time. It was. How do you view your England career when you look back at those 115 games? I sometimes think of it as a disappointment because we never won a tournament or we never got to a final. Do you have a regret of any kind? I don't have any regrets other than not winning something. And yeah, you could look back and say, well, it was disappointing because, you know, over those years we had great players, we had why didn't we win? Team. I ask people this who played in that team who weren't part of that team. Why do you think we didn't win the collection of players we had in 2004 and six in particular? Because we weren't good enough on the day. Simple as that. It had nothing to do because I've heard numerous people come out and say, well, you know, there was clicks and some players didn't talk to other players. I don't care whether players talk to each other whilst they're eating dinner, whilst they're eating lunch, while they're in the change room. The moment you get on that pitch, you don't you don't care whether Stevie G's in a better position than me. I'm going to give him the ball. Simple as that. You're footballers and you're a professional. It's not about clicks. It's not about Liverpool players not liking United players. We didn't know, did we? <laughs> you, you definitely didn't. <laughs> I, I thought it was all right, personally. I was in the middle. I was Switzerland. <laughs> Was there ever a point where you felt, is this all worth it with England? No. Playing in tournaments, at moments where it became difficult with the criticism? Never. And the, never, never felt like it was too much? No, never. I think there's so much expectation. And when you get knocked out of a tournament, you know what's coming. But there was never one moment where I thought, I don't want to do this. You know, I'm going to step down and play for my country. I used to say it to my dad that, you know, I never want to retire from international football. If I don't get picked again, I don't get picked again. But I never want to be one of those players that steps down from playing and representing my country. I might have stepped down captaining England because I felt it was the right time to let someone else take over. But I never thought for one minute that I was stepping away from playing for my country. I never wanted to be that player. How did your England career finish? Because at the end, you went to the last World Cup, didn't you? But you didn't take part. No. How, how did that end in terms of... Because I, I always remember you saying when you were younger, England will retire you, you won't retire from England. I always, to be fair, I adopted the same stance off the back of that because I agree with you. Mm. I don't believe it's a player's right. Even though we had friends who, to be fair, did retire. I didn't yeah, believe it was course. a player's right to retire. You yeah. either get picked or you don't get picked. And if they want you, you go and play. Absolutely. And, and you know, if someone turned around to me now and said, you're back in the squad... <laughs> you go, would you? Yeah, I'd go. <laughs> I'd go, it's simple as that, I'd, of course I'd go. They've got five right-backs, they won't be calling me. <laughs> Even if they didn't, I don't think they would. I don't think I've ever been as emotional as I was, like uncontrollable sobbing, which is slightly embarrassing because at the time, the Argentinian coach was going past and they were all banging up here. Uh, <laughs> We have a section called Failure is a Bruise, not a Tattoo, and I'm going to imagine that it will probably lie in your career around 1998 and that moment where obviously you got sent off against Argentina. Is that right? Would that be a low point of your whole career and the aftermath of it, really, and what came your way? No, it's all still a bit of a blur, in all honesty, that time, but I remember how tough it was. I remember, you know, we were both struggling at the time. It was a tough tournament to start off with, and then then got a little bit better and then got really bad. But I remember the moment when Glenn announced the team and we were both sat on the grass. Mm. And I remember thinking, because he'd not spoken to us, had he? No. And I'm thinking, right, I'm not in. And then it wasn't, I think, until after. I was like, you're not in. <laughs> <laughs> that was the biggest shock. I was like, I'm not in. And I played every game leading up yeah. to it nearly as well. And you, and you weren't in. Yeah. And I remember thinking, it was bizarre. I think it was the fact that we hadn't been spoken to, but you in particular, obviously, you were a massive obviously, name and you'd been, you played in every game. It was the fact that we hadn't been spoken to. It was the shock, wasn't it, of the surprise? I think it was a shock of that. And also, you know, we had, we had the upbringing of always being told, whether it by Jim Ryan yeah. or Eric Harrison or the boss, yeah. you know, they would always... He might never give us a reason. Might be a might be dodgy one as well, <laughs> but you're not playing. But you're not playing, <laughs> but you'd always know. And I think it was just, I don't know, it was just something about it that just didn't feel right. And, uh, you know, that was obviously a tough start to that. Mm. But then, you know, what happened after that for me, it was just, I think it was tough all round. 
I think, you know... Did that frustration from the early parts of the tournament, do you think, come out in the game against Argentina, or do you think it was just a one-off moment? I never felt that I was frustrated playing in those games. I don't remember going on that pitch wanting to prove a point or wanted to prove that I was frustrated because I'd been left out of the first couple of games. It was just a moment that happened where I reacted, and it was just a moment of madness, really. You know, when I, when I look back at my career and I talk about regrets, you know, that's, I, I wish that would never have happened. But I then look at the flip side, if it hadn't have happened, I might not have had the career that I had. I might not have been as strong as I was after that time to get through some of the stuff that I went through throughout my career. So I turned it into a positive, but, you know, it was one of those moments, of course, you, you never want that to happen in, in a game. I remember sitting on the coach with you next to you after, and it was, I mean, it was bad. It was really bad. I remember you walking into the dressing room. Some people supported you, but there was also some lads that went quiet on the way. I'm not going to ask for the names, but some lads went quiet on you, didn't they? And you felt let down by that at the time, didn't you? It's probably harsh to say I still feel let down by that, but I, I look back at that moment, and I, we were young. Yes, I'd made a mistake, but there's certain people, I think, in teams and in football that you expect to get behind you and expect to support you no matter what. And I think we always had that at United. And I felt, at the time, I think I felt let down. I it's, felt... A bit, it's a bit dumb and dumb, wasn't it? It's his... <laughs> <laughs> yeah, there were a few, like... Yeah. But I don't know. I, I actually didn't know what to think. Uh, you know, at that moment in time, I didn't know what to think, what to expect. I didn't know what was going to happen. I don't think I've ever been as emotional as I was coming out of that ground and seeing my mum and dad. And I remember looking up... Are you crying with them? Yeah, I was, like like uncontrollable, like sobbing, which, you know, is slightly embarrassing because at the time the Argentinian coach was going past and they were all banging on, you know, so it was a little bit embarrassing. But no, that was, that was but you tough. Are, but you are emotional, aren't you? I mean, the p people who know you know that you are emotional, particularly with your mum and dad, your family. Yeah. You, would, you would be emotional about those types of things. Yeah, yeah, because I also felt that I'd let quite a lot of people down but I didn't even think and expect what was going to happen for the next few years. You know, after that, I knew that, you know, it was, it was going to be a, a tough moment going back home, but I never expected it to be as bad as it was. When was your first conversation with Sir Alex, boss, after that? The morning after. He phoned me early, early morning, and he said, are you OK, son? And I said, yes. And I think I got emotional <laughs> to him as well, believe it or not. <laughs> and he just said, don't worry, go away for a few weeks. Go somewhere quiet, which <laughs> I went to New York. <laughs> <laughs> New York. Uh, but my wife was there. My wife was there. Victoria was there. <laughs> so I was going to meet her because she was on, a, obviously, a world tour. So I went to meet her. It was probably the worst place I could have gone just because the media was just, it was just a, a nightmare from the moment because we went to the World Cup on the Concord and then, then we arrived back on the Concord, I think it was. That was a bit embarrassing when it came back on the Concord. Yeah, a little bit. Which, <laughs> probably shouldn't have come back on that. <laughs> but I remember getting back and I remember walking through the airport then and being absolutely abused by this one TV reporter at the time saying how I'd let my parents down, my grandparents down. This was in London family. when we landed? This was at Heathrow, Heathrow when we landed. And then I obviously went to New York to see Victoria. What did Victoria say to you? Do I don't remember? think she... she well, I phoned her after the game and she went, what happened? <laughs> I was like, um... Didn't go that well. Uh, it wasn't great. <laughs> so the gaffer called me. He just said, don't worry about it. Go away for a few weeks come back to the club and you've got us. And that was all I needed to hear. How do you describe the press reaction, the media reaction? I mean, it was absolutely incredible. It didn't just continue for a day, a week. Four years. <laughs> it Four went, years. But it went on, didn't it, with the sort of the hanging the effigies of you outside pubs. It went on into yeah. the, the, the away games. Yeah. I always remember the West Ham one, where you actually had to have about five security guards around you because there was yeah. threats to your life. You had to contend with a lot at that time. It was mad, wasn't it, really? Yeah, I think it was. Every game that season, apart from obviously every time we played at Old Trafford, was horrendous. Every talk show, everywhere I went, 
every time I put petrol in the car I was getting abused <laughs> so whether it was in Manchester whether it was in London it, it didn't matter but I think the thing that got me through that particular season with the United fans because that first game I was nervous anyway because I didn't know what the reaction was going to be but then that first corner I walked over with the ball and I looked up and the whole stand just rose and just like it was it was that's, it was that's, how, that's how I got through that season. Moving it forward to 2004 and 6, the wives and girlfriends came to the camps. Whether people behave themselves in the right manner. Or... That was just my dad and your dad. Yeah, that was just our dads. <laughs> I remember waking up that morning, you went, but have you seen the picture of my dad? <laughs> Hi, everyone. I hope you're enjoying this episode. This is just a quick thank you to Skybet, our partners, for making this show happen. It's something I've wanted to do for a long, long time. Please subscribe. There's loads more episodes coming up, and I hope you're enjoying it. Right, let's get back into this episode. So we've just come to Souk Al Wakra in the middle of nowhere in Qatar, and believe it or not, we're at the entrance to the what's going to be the England Team Hotel. What what were we saying 16 years ago? If we turned up and this is the entrance, well, what to the would you say? Who chose this? <laughs> I'm sure it's lovely inside. <laughs> It, it's, it's I'm strange, sure it's lovely inside. Yeah, it's strange from out here though, isn't it? When you look at it. To be fair, it feels in the middle of nowhere and it's on the beach. What more do you want? Right, let's go and have a look and see how we go. When you were England captain, you would be consulted, wouldn't you, in terms of what an England camp would look like? What sort of things would be important to the squad, to the backroom team? I think every player was different, but I think once you're in a tournament, you know, again, you know, we spoke about the responsibilities of being England captain. Those are the kind of things you actually get brought into, which actually I quite enjoyed. You know, I like those kind of things, being involved in you know, where we stayed, the atmosphere, the games room. Because once we started getting players like Wazza, you know, who was 16, 17, into the squad, you had these younger group of players that actually enjoyed games rooms yeah. and things like that, whereas we were just happy to just sit Pipes in the room. And and... <laughs> <laughs> Pipes and slippers. Pipes and slippers. So, you know, I think the things that you kind of look for is tranquility more than anything. Yeah. You want to be in the middle of nowhere. As much as you want a little bit of atmosphere around the hotel, when you're in a tournament, all you care about is the games. And I mean, this is the perfect setup. To be honest with you, this place here, I, must, I was a bit worried when we pulled up outside. <laughs> but when you get in here... I thought it looked all right. You're just a bit posh. <laughs> this bit's unbelievable though, isn't it really? The players will love it in here, won't this courtyard? You'd like to think so, but they're all young kids I, I, I don't know I don't I mean maybe, me and maybe you I'm would thinking a bottle here. of wine <laughs> me and you with a nice bottle of red something nice <laughs> so in terms of going back to the camps that you stayed at 98 was your first tournament Le Boule yeah. it was a golf course camp mm. what do you think of it I never liked staying on a golf course because there was a lot of golfers within the team. Yeah. It felt like they were more concerned about getting out on the golf course. <laughs> when could we get our next nine holes? Yeah, and I was I was really not a... Yeah, I wasn't a golfer, to be honest. I'd rather just sit, relax, uh, protect my back. <laughs> but even though you were kind of protected, I never really enjoyed, you know, staying actually on a golf course, personally. What Did you think that one was a bit remote as well, that camp? It was a bit... Strange, wasn't it? That? I liked being remote, though. Did you? I didn't. I I loved being away from everyone. My life was so crazy yeah. at that point. The fact that I was in the middle of nowhere, no one around. Yeah. I was happy to just sit in my room. You know, we roomed together. I was happy to just sit. You, you had enough excitement in your life, and I didn't. Did <laughs> no, obviously not. <laughs> <laughs> in terms of 2000, moving forward to Belgium and Holland, I thought it was a shambles, that one, did you? I actually can't remember it, to be honest. <laughs> I can't. <laughs> what, the base or the actual tournament? The Any tournament of it. Where, the tournament was where Phil gave the penalty. I remember that. <laughs> I think that tournament in general just wasn't one of my favourites. No, it was my worst tournament. I didn't go to 2002, I broke my foot. Yeah. 
Actual, what was that like? I don't in? remember that either. <laughs> <laughs> Do you remember you had Danny Mills playing behind you rather than me? Was it better? <laughs> Japan and Seoul. What was the base like? Do you remember? Oh yeah, I actually loved that tournament because I love being in Asia. Yeah. So I think that was one of the ones that I actually really enjoyed, to be honest. And then moving it forward to 2004 and six, that's where there was a huge shift, wasn't there, where the wives and girlfriends came to mm. the camps. Before that, it had been really quiet, quite remote, yeah. isolated. And then it was a case of, well, look, why don't we try and sort of integrate the families, change it up a little bit. Yeah. Do you think that worked or not? In, on reflection now, when you look back, because obviously there's a lot of there was a lot of attention around the wives and girlfriends leading into those tournaments. There was. I always believed, as an England captain, that having the kids around and wives and or girlfriends around wasn't a bad thing. You know, I totally understand. You, you, once you're in training camp, you're in training camp, and you have to focus and things like that. But I think at the start of a tournament and after a game, things. Like, I don't think that that is a bad thing. But looking back, that kind of whole culture at the time, I think, you know, there was a lot of attention around that. And I think that, you know, whether people behave themselves in the right manner or, you know, I don't know. And that, just, that was just my dad and your dad. Yeah, that was just our dads. <laughs> well, On tables, you know, I remember. I remember waking up that morning, you went, my dad. Have you seen the picture of my dad? He's dancing like, on a table with a, with a fake remember. World Cup Says I'd snap. So I, I, I thought 2006 <laughs> to be fair in Baden Baden. That was the joke, wasn't it? Neville Neville in Baden Baden. Yeah. But, <laughs> but basically, I always think at that. I thought I thought it went over the top a little bit. I thought we just lost it. Lost that little bit of balance. I think that it went too far, and it was a case. It became a bit of a circus. In I mean, Victoria wasn't even there, was she? In 2006 no. at all? Hardly. I think she came for one day. Yeah. So it wasn't even related to the sort of most famous wife or girlfriend, mm. which was Victoria. It was just the whole thing, wasn't it? I thought, I thought the balance tipped too far. Yeah, I mean, even Victoria, she's the first to say now, when she looks back, you know, she's like, what was I doing? What was I wearing? What, why would I do that? You know? Gaz and Phil. <laughs> Donkey. <laughs> Donkey. Gaz, it's a horse. It's a horse, is it? Oh, yeah. it's a white horse, sorry. Oh, you got a bird on the back as well. Yeah. Oh, they're, they're famous over here. Yeah. They, they do something, don't they? What do they do? They hunt. They hunt, yeah, they yeah. do, they do hunt. Hey, are they, you? <laughs> <laughs> go back to 2006, though. It did go, I think it went a little bit too far. Yeah, I think it did. I think there was more spoken about the wives and girlfriends than there was... The football. The football, which, yeah. you know, at that time, especially for the players more than anything, you know, you want to focus on on the tournament rather than anything else. So I do think that it went too far but I also do believe that having the wives and girlfriends and, and family around at the right times is a good thing. What do you think of this place here in terms of you know England you've got the beach you've obviously got this sort of little walk here with like a little souk shopping area little bars and cafes what do you reckon to the choice that England have made this time on well, the face I of it? Actually, I actually think it seems a very quiet area which is perfect i think for any kind of you know tournament hideaway but i think what's great about you know what's happening here is as a player there's no flying around to games there's no you know all of that that we, yeah, we used hated to that, do and you know you play a game you leave after the game you're not getting in till three four o'clock in the morning then you're having to recover you know we never made excuses but those are the things that actually really matter in a tournament so I think the less travel that you can have, and that's what's great about here, you know, the, the longest time that you're going to travel is literally 45 minutes on a bus. This is the first time a World Cup is being hosted in this region. This is going to be a tournament that you're not going to want to miss. I really love this England team. The good that they're doing outside of the game is exceptional. Please. Keep you up all night, that Gary. <laughs> Cheers. Oh, it's a bit. What is it? <laughs> Arabic coffee, Gary. Very nice. So, just rearing this England camp, 
We're in this courtyard where all the lads are going to be sat in the summer. What do you think it's going to be like as a tournament for the players? I think for the players, it's facilities, you know, where they're going to be training, where they're going to be staying, the weather. I think it's set up perfectly. Now, speaking as a fan, I've been coming to Qatar now for quite a number of years. I've seen the hospitality. I've seen the warmth for the people. And, you know, we talk about football being for everybody. We talk about the World Cup being for everybody. And this is the first time that a World Cup is being hosted in this region. And that is an incredible moment, you know, to be able to see the likes of Messi, Ronaldo, all of these great players that they look up to. It's going to inspire so many different generations. This is going to be a, an incredible experience. And yes, it's new. Yes, people don't know too much about the region. But believe me, this is going to be a tournament that you're not going to want to miss. I remember being in Portugal with you in 2004. And it was said after a lot of England tournaments that we were always tired, weren't we? Our legs went, didn't they, in the latter part of the tournament. Yeah. I know that it's not been moved to the winter for fatigue reasons, it's been moved to the winter for weather reasons, which obviously would have to happen if you were having a tournament in the Middle East or in the Arab region. How big an impact do you think that will have on the players in terms of playing before Christmas, particularly Premier League players? It's always been said that England players struggle with it being in the sort of summer in June, July. Personally, I feel for our team, I think it's a huge opportunity because like you said, you know, we never did use it as an excuse, but truth be told, we came to the end of a gruelling season in the Premiership, toughest league in the world, and you are tired. You do want a rest and you don't have that time to recover from a tough season. But these players are coming into this tournament at a time where they're at their peak. They've had their rest, they're in the middle of their season, there's no reason and no excuse for them to be at the top of their game and at the top of their fitness. So for our players, this is a real opportunity. You know, we have a young team, we have an exciting team, we have a manager that has been with these players for a long time and I really love watching this England team play. You know, they're exciting, they play with passion, they play like they want to be there and it's something that... As an England fan, that's what you want to see. And all of a sudden, our fans have come together behind this team again. You know, because for a moment, you know, our fans, I wouldn't say fell out of love with the national team, but there was a disconnect. Yeah. Whereas all of a sudden, there's a connection. And, and I think Gareth's done an incredible job with that. How do you compare this England team to the one that we played in? What was your best England team that you played in, you think, 2004-06, would you say? Yeah, I think so. How would you compare this team to that team? You know, there's an excitement within this team. And I talk about these players, about, you know, they're more than just footballers. And I think what I love about this generation of players, particularly in England, is with the power that they have on the field, they're trying to make change off the field. You know, I see the work that Marcus has done. I see the work that Raheem has done. I see the work that other players have done that are in those positions. The good that they're doing outside of the game is exceptional, is, is really exceptional because they're using their platform to be able to help other people and to make change. Because what goes on in their lives should never be going on. But the fact that they are now helping other people and helping educate other people into racism, into the stuff that's going on that, that they go through every single day, whether it's social media or everyday life, they are making change. And that's why I love this group of players and this generation. Well, that feels like a great place to finish. Cheers, mate. Good to see you. Thank you mate. Are we going out tonight? <laughs> I'll, I'll get, get the meal. I'll get the meal. I'll get the meal. Where are we going? <laughs> I can't say it. It's too posh. <laughs>